because I didn't really take much notice of the time. So when I finished that book, I, um, I went back to see what was in the Otago Witness dot sort of photo page. And what I found was an extraordinary social and personal history, and, and in many ways a unique one. And I started to read and I realised, oh, well, I, I worked out that the, the column had started in 1886, in July 1886. But in fact, the column had been going, the children's column had been going on, had been going in the Otago Witness since 1876. Now, this is extraordinary because that means the children's column in the Otago Witness, which, by the way, was a weekly paper, was the weekly adjunct, if you like, to the Otago Daily Times. It was a bit of the magazine style newspaper. Um, 1876, it must be, if not the first, one of the very first children's columns ever in the world. And it's an extraordinary thing. And it came from Dunedin. And, but it didn't do very well. It, 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 it started off okay. Papers, the paper tried to encourage the children to be interested, but it wasn't a correspondence column. It was never fully interactive. Although they did run little competitions. And they, worked, they, they ran anagram competitions quite a lot. And it was extraordinary. In 1877, the, the paper asked all the children <coughs> to send in as many words that they could make out of the word hermaphroditically. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know whether any of the children ever asked their parents what that word actually meant, but I find it extraordinary in the mid-Victorian age that they should have chosen a word like that. Um, but they, 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 that column was also full of a lot of Victorian didactic stuff. Horrible, horrible, moralistic, semi-religious tracts which terrified everybody. And you know, the, 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 the bad Agnes, the Scottish girl who was surrounded by demons and, and, and thrown into the mountains and all sorts of dreadful, frightening things that kind of done anything but create wet beds, as far as I'm concerned, <laughs> for these poor kids. But, and it's, it started to fail. Every so often, the, 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 it, would, it would appear every so often, but not regularly. But then in 1986, a letter appeared in the, the column of the, the Our Little Folks by Dot. And, and Dot, Dot wrote in a letter telling the children that she was here for them, that she was here to listen to anything that she had, that they wanted to tell her about their cats and their birthday parties and their family and their schools. And she said, she said, I will never, I will never consider any letter too trivial to attend to. And in time, I wish to be your friend. Well, she never really kept that promise because she often told the children not for being so boring. But, um, <laughs> but it was the start. And, and it was the start of the most extraordinary ride, if you like, through, through the history of journalism in, in this country. It was immensely popular from the beginning. And it carried on right through. The last stop was um, a lovely lady called Dick Lebrun, and she died in Wellington just in 2000. So she, she was Dot in the 1980s. So this column lasted 100 years. Dot lasted 100 years. Now Dot, as, a, as a, a, a journalistic character, if you like, must be one of the longest living journalistic characters we have in this country. Probably Sibis is the oldest, is the longest lasting, if you like. But Dot, Dot made it to 100 years. So that's, that's, that's pretty good. So I started to read. And I thought, well, what have we got here? I, I expected to get a, his, a, a view of Victorian childhood. That's, I, I thought this might be a bit light on. But that these kids will write about their lives and their school and, and their family. Then, then it'll be very interesting to see what they, how they view their world. And I started to read and, and I thought, dear God, I've got a cat and I've got a canary. Can you please give it a name? It was truly Mary. Dear God, I've got a dog. Can you please give it a name? Yours truly Mary. I thought there's nothing in this at all. This is going to be just a waste of time. And then I, in 1887 I came across a letter from Friedrich, little Friedrich then. Friedrich was 11. And he just said, Dear Doc, my name is Friedrich and I live with my papa. I'm 11 years old. I will be 12 soon if God spares my life. And I live in, I live with, I, in the Nevis, which is the back of Pommel, with my papa. My mama died when she was born and I have no brothers and sisters. I'm very lonely. And then he goes on to describe his life and his, and his relationship with his father, because his father is the only person in his world. 
And he said, I, I, I'd like to have see other children, but we never see other children. We come to Cromwell once a year to get supplies. And that's when I have some fun, he said. But the rest of the time, I'm just, it's just me and Papa. And it's the most extraordinarily sad little letter. It is very, a, one, a letter about a wonderful relationship between the son and the father in this, in this dreadful place. I don't know if you've ever been to the Nevis, but you've never want to be there, especially if it's a day like this. And, and that made me realise that there was something more, that there is a history to write in these pages beyond cats and canaries and dogs and names. And in fact, Freddie wrote several times, and um, he, he went to Australia with his father, and before he, he left, he said, oh, my aunt who lives in Australia wants me to go and live with her because she said, I've had too much knocking about in my life. But I'm not going to leave Papa because that would be too sad, and I don't think Papa would ever leave me. So there was just something wonderful about this character. And his name, he was terribly proud of his name. It's called Frederick Percy Ford or Geoffrey Bennett. <laughs> <laughs> and it, that made me laugh, but then I started to cry because it was P.S. You'll be wondering where, where those names came from, Doc. Well, they are the names of my uncles, my mother's brothers. She would have wanted me to, she, those are the names she would have wanted me to be called before she died. And so he, she, he throws it back at you again. And the children constantly do this. So, so at the very beginning, for, for the 1880s and 1890s, I, I gathered together all these letters and sorted them all out because I wanted to see how these, how these kids were viewing their world. And that's what I got, the, the, the Freddies. I got a lot of letters about school, about, about technology, about change. The, a lot of rural kids were writing because they were lonely like Freddie. And they'd come to Dunedin and just be absolutely scarred at what they saw. One little kid, Johnny for Winters, right? he was eight. He came to Dunedin in 1889. He was beside himself. And he said, Doc, there were so many wonderful things to see. He said, but the most wonderful thing at all, it was all, well, they took us up to Roslyn on this funny little coach without horses. And I could not think of how it was done. So he's on the tram, and this is new to him. A kid from Wedderburn, the Otago Central Railway went through in the late 1890s, arrived at Wedderburn in 1890, or 1900. And the schoolboys are there. The, the schoolboys from St. Bathans have come down to play Wedderburn. And the train arrives. Now, St. Bathans is only 15 miles away from Wedderburn. But then the train's been coming through Wedderburn for some time, but the boys have never seen the train. And, they, and one wrote and said, Doc, we stood on the platform and stared at it and thought it was something wonderful. Never seen it before. Now, the trains brought the, 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 the rural children to the cities, as I said, and so they saw all sorts of wonderful, interesting things. So you get, you, 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 that, that they talk about school a lot. They talk about the fear of, of the examiners arriving and, and the, 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 you know, this, this hit and miss education system that these children that they were going through because the, the examinations were essentially you start in class and you were, you, know, you were asked questions by Mr. Examiner who came around on circuit and you know, if your teacher happened to you know, ask you to read the right books, you were okay, but half the time the teacher didn't know what the curriculum so they talk about that. They talk about their brothers and sisters, of course. They talk about, you know, the boys talk about rabbiting a lot. <laughs> Every second letter is about rabbiting. Um, and the girls, just the girls talk about their, their home life. It, with the Victorian children, what was happening is that they, we were getting these views from the, 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 the views of the outside world, if you like. But they were also quite guarded because Mama and Papa, apart from people like Freddie, who was quite honest with his relationship with his father and talking about that, Mama and Papa were sort of shadow figures in their, in their letters. They, it was probably not politic or polite to write about your parents, and that's probably why they didn't. Because also, of course, the parents would be vetting their letters. The you know, parents would want to know what's being written. And the fact that they were in the paper, and so the, the parents would be very interested to know what their child was talking about. Um, but they do it in a very... Bit, bit. So they're quite happy letters in a way. But there's another side to this part of this, the, to the history. And the children do write about bad things. They write about th sad, tragic things in their lives, but they do it in a very clever way. So in 1893, all of a sudden, cats and dogs took over the page. And it started with Muffy, a cat called Muffy. She was coming from, and she was from Invercargill. She wrote, Dear Doc, my name's Muffy. I used to live in the country with my little brother Frisky, but I got taken away and I now live in town. 
and, and maybe Frisky, if he's still in the country, will write to you one day, yours truly, Buffy the Cat. Well, two weeks later, dear Doc, my name's Frisky, and I saw in the paper that my sister wanted you to write to me, so I wanted me to write to you, so I'm doing so. Now, this started this most enormous craze. Within months, there were no humans writing to me. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, there was everything. Cats, dogs, horses, fish, rabbits, rats, ferrets, everything. <laughs> and, and it's extraordinary. Uh, of course, this isn't unusual because you know, the kids were reading things like Aesop's Fables and they were reading Lewis Carroll and they were reading Edward Lear. So you get all this. But, but this collection of letters is rather special because when you look at them, they're not very nice. The, the animals are all old and useless. Or they're young and helpless. So that they're a newborn pup or a newborn kid who's going to get drowned tomorrow. So I'm going to run away from home because I heard them talking at the table of doctor that they're going to drown me. Or they're old, the dogs are old. Or maltreated in some way. They, when the kids write as rabbits, you know, there's one little kid writes as Jack the Rabbit who lives under the schoolhouse at Middlemarch in 1895. And he said, oh, my life's terrible, Doc. Everyone, look, dogs, cats, boys, everyone's trying to get at me. It's simply not fair, Doc, that the acclimatisation society in New Zealand brought us here in the first place. We didn't ask to come. <laughs> <laughs> Poor old Jack had a terrible life. And, and then the kids started writing his things teapots and looking glasses and, 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 and plates and even a thing like a fire top. What, what, what are these kids up to? And, and then you start to realise why they're doing this. I said how all the animals are all, were old and useless and broken. What they were doing was talking about the less happy side of their life but using some sort of persona to do it. Where they wouldn't get caught. And this is particularly clear when you come to the objects. And the first object was a looking glass. She was terribly proud of herself. She, the looking glass was, was, was somewhat of an arist aristocratic young lady. She had been made in a very fine Parisian furniture house. She had been put on a boat with a piano, <laughs> who she made great friends with on the way out to Fort Chalmers, by the way. And, and anyway, and then she was put in a store in, in uh, Dunedin, and she was bought by a lovely young mistress who took her home and set her up in her boudoir. And, and, and the looking glass is telling God, you know, what a, what a wonderful life. The mistress was very nice to me. And we, we were very happy for many years. But then the mistress got married. And she said that the master was a violent, angry man. And one day, in a rage, he lashed out and cracked my face. This is the mirror of the looking glass. And now I live in Otauta in an attic with the spiders. And what's being said here? You know, what, what has that kid seen? Has she seen something that's happened to her? Is she talking about something that's happened to her? Was she, was she beaten by her father or somebody? Or has she seen her mother in a domestic violence situation? There are too many of these letters of this kind not, not to start thinking that way. And, and, and if so, therefore, you've got to balance all these happy little letters with, with these rather dark, disturbing, disturbing ones. And I think that's how these young children managed to, to talk about the, uh, you know, the, the not so good things of their lives. They, they didn't talk about death much, but they did as an animal or a thing. They talked about their, 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 school kid, their, their schoolmates dying, because of course mortality was child and adult was so high in the 1880s, 1890s. And they were describing at funerals of their children, of the um, of their schoolmates, but they never once mentioned if the mother has died or the father has died, which of course happened all the time. So there we had the, the Victorian children. But then something else happened. In 1897, a star writer lit up the page. And he was a 15-year-old high school boy who had come down to board at a time boys. He called himself the high school boy from the back blocks, that was his nom de plume, if you like. But his real name was Bob Gillingham, and he came from Fairley. Now, whether or not Bob, Bob just didn't come out of the blue. 
the Gillingham family had connections with the Otago Daily Times editor, Mr. William Finnick. I think that what that, that William Finnick commissioned Bob to begin writing a series of letters because the first are quite set pieces. They're not just off the cuff things that they've got a reason for, for, for what they say. Um, and it may not have even been Bob. Bob Gillingham certainly was a high school boy, 15 years old at the time of the boys. There's no doubt about that. And I know he was a person. And he was a, he was a school kid. But, but his, both his parents were journalists for the Otago Witness as well. Whether the letters from Bob were from the mother, or the father, or Bob, or a combination, we don't know. But probably that doesn't matter so much, is that Bob's letters created a revolution in the page. And what happened was that the other adolescent teenagers started to write. So you had the boys started first, following him from, oh, Bob's a great, because Bob would write these funny letters about, about being a, a boy or a boy's high and getting up all these high jinks and things like that. So he's very, he's very funny, great writer. So the boys thought, oh, this is a lot of fun, I'm going to tell Bob about my life. So, so within months of Bob's first letter, the page is almost full of teenage boys' letters. 15, 16, 17, even up to 18. And one boy who follows Bob very closely, and by, the, they also, by this time they're using non diploma I have to say, not their real names. The, the Victorian children use their real names, but these, these teenagers are using non diploma And so what's, um, one is Dickie Donovan. Now Dickie Donovan's first letter is 1893, sorry, 1898. And he's at Morven Hill Station in, o, in Ohau, in the back of the arm, right up the, right up the sticks. He's a shepherd, and he says, Dear Doc, I'm 18, and I'm a, I'm a muster of sheep at Old Morven Hill Station. I'm monarch of all I survey, which at the moment is one old horse, three dogs, nine pussy cats, and two ferrets. <laughs> well, what's an 18-year-old farm boy writing it to a kid's page for? He says, I want to be like Bob. I've got a dream, Doc. I'm going to be a writer. And he sent in a short story with his first letter, and it's called Dickie Donovan and Goes Pig Hunt. And, and he said, oh, Doc, would you please, would you publish it for me? And, and Dickie got his first break. Doc published Dickie Donovan, he was big hunting. And it's an extraordinary little story. It's, it's a great little story. Doc told him off for it, though. She said, Dickie, this is too colloquial. The language is not right. New Zealand boys are far better educated than what, than what you're suggesting in this letter. She said, boys, New Zealand boys, colonial boys, don't speak the way that you have written. Well. She was wrong, very wrong, because if you didn't know better, you would swear, if you read Dickie Donovan Goes Pig Hunting, you would think it's Barry Crump, mm -hmm. or even Frank mm -hmm. Sargison. Mm -hmm. so, so Dickie was at the forefront of this genre of New Zealand vernacular literature, way before it became popular or accepted. <laughs> and he wrote a lot. But he never, he, he wrote a lot of stories about Dickie Donovan doing this and Dickie Donovan going that, but he never actually returned to that strong colloquialism that he used in his first letter, which is, it, it's, it, it's interesting. And, but anyway, he, he managed his dream, because instead of staying a shepherd on Morven Hill Station, Dickie Donovan, who happened to be Ben Iverson, his real name was Ben Iverson, was Dunedin boy, became, in 19, became a reporter with the man of, uh, with the, and a two paper, and I'm trying to think of the name, I can't think of what it is now, Ensign or something. Um, and then he became the editor, and he was editor of, and, and, a, and a sports writer and a well known journalist in New Zealand, right from the 1900s until, until he died in the 1940s. So he did achieve that, and it started with one little letter to Doc. So, we, so, so we've got the, the teenage girl, boys, but we've got the girl, no, teenage girls under period. The, the girls are still. The, the, the young Victorian model. But then Bob starts, the, but then Dickie Donovan and Bob and then another few other boys start having discussions. And instead of writing to Dot, they start to write to each other. In the page, you know, dear, you know instead of saying, oh dear Dot, whatever, it'll be, oh dear Dickie, you know, I liked your last letter, Bob, you know. Yeah. And so they started connecting, if you like. Now, the, 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 the Victorian children had never done this, they'd never mentioned each other or anything. It was always the relationship between the child and Dot, but never between other correspondents. 
But the boys, teenage boys started this blogging. They started this Facebook, essentially. That's what it was. And, of course, one topic that came up very early it were girls. <laughs> Bob didn't think much of girls. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and Dickie, you know, Dickie didn't die either. And there was one horrible little boy, I forget what his, I forget what his number between was, and all he said, all he wrote, right, and they started discussing, and all he wrote is, oh dear Bob and Dickie, I've got four sisters. Look, I don't think much of girls, never like them, never will. <laughs> and what happened was the teenage girls started to write. Because they got most offended at this. <laughs> and there was one lovely, delightful one, and her name was Devonshire Dumpling. She's always out there. And she was the first teenage girl, and she said, Doc, I, I've had enough of this. And I reckon, and, and all girl, and all you teenage girls, all, well, they didn't use the word teenage, teenage I have to say. All, all, all you girls out there, well, you've got to stand up for yourselves, and we've got to fight back. We want to reclaim our page. <laughs> Not the direction, but I had the page. <laughs> and I said, these boys have got to be taken down to people too. So, you know, and Doc, you've got to help us on this. So anyway, so, so the girls started to write. And they, they, they give the boys peeps. <laughs> and of course, the boys just give it all straight back again. So you get this, this, you get this double blogging. So this is all happening. And they, they go beyond, they go beyond just the, the, relate, the, the gender situation between girls and boys. That's, that in itself is interesting because you get this one girl, Jessie C. Now Jessie C is from Gaul. She's a farm girl from Gaul. And Jessie, is a, she's an only child. No, no brothers. And she said, oh, I've got, you know, Don, I've got to do all the farm work. I've got to do the, you know, plowing. I've got to do the mustering. I've got to do the whatever. And, and you know, every, every Sunday I have to kill sheep for, for tea. And of course, all hell breaks loose in the page after she's told, after she said this, because all the city girls get very upset about this. And, and they absolutely ostracise this Jessie C. One, one writes and says, oh, she must be dreadful. Dreadful girl she must be. Oh, I'm glad I live in Deneen, nothing, nowhere near Gore, because I wouldn't want her anywhere near any of my pets. And, and Jessie says, oh, it's, and she replies, and says, oh, it's so stupid, that's just farm life. You know, in fact, if, 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 Eileen, Eileen, if you want to come down go, to go, you know, by all means do come down, I'll give you a lesson for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, and then the boys start to get involved in this, and the boys, some of the boys are very supportive of Jessie C, and, and, and Dickie Donovan particularly, and Dickie that even, you know, compares with people like Joan Bark and Florence Nightingale. <laughs> and they, they are the sort of girls young New Zealand needs, Dickie says, and, and others, other boys just have no. That's, that's too unladylike, you know. Girls do not do that. So you get this interesting, and, and, and what you start to forget that we're talking about the 1890s, you know, it's because this is so modern, what these kids are saying. And, and, and it's not, as I said, the, the lines of demarcation are very unclear because it's not boys against girls over, over the GCC story. It's, it's just what these teenagers saw as as gender roles. Some of them, they all had different attitudes and different some very modern, some very some some very traditional of, of gender roles. So it's all getting starts the story starts to get very interesting. And they go on from this. They that they they then start talking about all other sorts of things. And topics like dancing. One girl brings up and the top oh doc, I don't think dancing's appropriate for young girls. And so this starts in the whole discussion. <laughs> and you know, and then the other girl writing, well why? What's wrong with it? Yeah. I go to a dance every week. With my with mama and papa, I love it. And the other you know, and and you know, I can't understand why you don't like dancing. Is there something wrong with your dancing shoes? Do they do they not fit properly? Do your feet get too sore? And and then the, the other one comes back and she says, no, she said, a private dance is all right in one's house. And, and you know, often in the parlour in an evening, you'd roll up the carpet and my mum would get on the piano and dance it. Private dance is okay, but what this, these girls, the certain of these girls were objecting to was the public display involved in going to a public hall and, and being seen to be enjoying yourself. Because, you know, strict, strong Presbyterian Dunedin, you know, I didn't like that very much. And, um, and, and these letters weren't coming from country children. Because the dance, 
at the theatre you brought up in the country, you'll know that the, the, the dance in the local school hall or the local hall was, was, was essential for, for, for rural, early rural New Zealand society, but not in Dunedin. You know, you went, you didn't have to come sort of out to get fun. Um, so, so you get this very interesting thing, and then the girls start go the next step. And this is where it gets extremely interesting, because they then start talking about growing up. That they, and, and it started in 1989 with this girl called Madcap Eileen. They had wonderful nom de plume, these kids are Madcap Eileen. She's got, I'm 16, and my mum wants me to put my hair up and go into long skirts. And I don't want to do that because I've been going to know. What do you think, Dot? Now, it's interesting for a start because this girl, Mama, has told her what she wants. Eileen has gone to Dot and is asking her what she thinks about this. And Dot comes back very interestingly. Says, yes, I think she's 16 is too young. Don't forget that once your hair is up, it will never come to, it can never be worn down again. And that was true. Uh, the, the Victorian Edwardian women, you know, once they put, you know, you see these photos of this enormous hair. You were never allowed to be seen in public with your head out. It was, it was just not the done thing. Once, once you'd taken that step, and, and the long skirts came at the same time. But what Dot, what Dot was doing was actively standing against the mother's advice. And this is where it starts to get interesting. And, I'm, and I do wonder sometimes about what if these mothers were actually looking at this. But they, they continue to do it. And, and, you know, a lot of them, a lot of girls were raised, I agree with this, because they saw this as losing their freedom. You know, childhood meant freedom. A, a young Edwardian woman, you know, it meant, it meant responsibility, it meant the curtailing of all, of all the good things in life. And, um, you know, one, one says, another girl says, oh, look, I agree with Mad, Mad Cap Eileen. And I'm 16, I'm 17, and I'm not going to put my hair up till I'm at least 21. You know, I don't care what my mum says. Well, it's interesting because a couple of months later, at this point, the, um, the, the kids were sending in their photographs in, and were being published in the paper as well. So you get these little, wonderful little um, collages of, of, all these, of all the dots that have people. And they were also meeting at uh, winter show times. They started in 1991 with this and they'd have their photograph taken outside First Church. So you get you know, a hundred of them, you know, big photos of all these kids. And, and one, Madcap Eileen wrote, she saw this photograph, she said, oh, whatever her name was, we'd say to Mary. Mary, I thought you said you weren't going to put your hair up because you were 21. Why, your hair's up in that photo that I saw last week. How come? Mama had insisted. So it's, you can see that there's a battle going on between these young girls. And, and, and one says, I thought, isn't it terrible that we have to do this? Because even at 20, that, 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 that means we've got another maybe 40 or 50 years of womanhood. And the words she used are, is that not long enough to be sad and stayed in? Wow. So, oh, and, yes. and, and what they're doing, these kids, are look, these young girls are looking at their mothers. I think they think, I don't want to be like this. And they're in a very interesting situation because these are post, these are post-1893 girls. These are post-vote girls. You know, they do feel slightly empowered. They are educated girls, and they do see that you know, in 1900 there were opportunities for women to, to, to even to go into professions. They knew this, but they also knew that things could happen that were going to drag them all away from that. For example, if you have a large family and you're the oldest daughter, and maybe you might have seven or eight siblings, and something happens to mama, who takes over? The oldest daughter. And she's stuck there for probably the rest of her life. And there's one very interesting letter from her, from one, and she only writes once, she names Vincent Veritas, she calls herself the Nick of Veritas. And she's writing at the end of her day, and she said, Doc, I'm so tired. Mama died about six months ago, and I have to look after all my family. And I'm only 15. But she said, I get so angry with them because they try my patience so much. But I did promise Mama that that's what I would do, that I would look after 
my siblings before she died. And so, she, you know, and, and the letter, it just, you only have to read between the lines to see how desolate she sees her life. Particularly when, when some of these other girls are writing about, um, you know, working in a photographic shop or, you know, going to, to tech to, to, to learn typing and all these sorts of things. So, it's very interesting. This, this. And so, in many ways, so the book is, is so much more than what, what you know, uh, I thought it was going to be. And it's so many different angles and aspects of, of life. Now, the, I, I spend a lot of time talking about the girls because they, uh, it's, they have a very significant story with this. But, and the, but then you compare the boys. The boys aren't, the boys don't want to know anything about this. The boys just keep on talking about rabbiting and going camping and fishing and all this sort of stuff. They never once mention growing up. So the girls, the girls are euphemistically talk when they talk about hair up and skirts. Of course, they had to do that, but they're also talking about their puberty. They are talking about their change of life. They're, they're, you know, there's one that gets very, very close to this. Shush to her name is, and she almost. She almost says it, but she, she withdraws, but it's, it's clear that this is what we're really worried about. She talks about Mama giving her the talk, and she said it was awful, but she said, I, was, I still have nightmares. She said, Mama came in, and she sat by the bed, and she told me, and hey, Doc, I don't want to grow up. No, mm -hmm. she was terrified. And, but the boys, the boys, and I, well, all teenage boys don't. I mean, are there any more guarded, circumspect bunch of people than teenage boys? They just won't tell you anything. And they're the same here. Um, but there's only, there's only one, Harry Crawford, and he says, oh, Doc, I went into the barber to get a haircut the other day. And Harry was, I don't know, 15, maybe, uh, 14, 15. And, and I sat in the chair, and, I, and, and the barber came along, and they said, shave, sir. He said, I got a bit so red in the face, I grabbed my cap and ran out. <laughs> he, said, he said, I'm not going to do that. And um, but hardly at all do the boys always talk about this. But, but the boys have fun, you know, where the, girl, where the girls' lives are, the girls often see their lives as going like that, and the boys see their lives as going like that. But, but given the time, 1905 or so, these boys are going to grow up very fast in 10 years' time, because these are boys who are going to be at the war. And, and I have a whole section called Voices Silenced, and I think it's a very special section because I can, I can identify a lot of these early docks little folk boys, of which my great-uncle Bob, Shiny Bob, from Gilbert was one. Wonderful writer, absolute star writer, very, very big celebrity stats that a lot of these boys had in the paper. They were you know, heroes. And, and, you know, and he finished in 1909, and, and Dot said, oh, he's a great footballer. And he, he stopped writing in 1909, and Dot said, oh, look, I'm sorry to see you go, Bob, because you've been in so entertaining, and especially with your football stories, and I'm glad that you leave the game with a laugh on your lips. Well, he did leave the game. He left the game in 1918 when he was killed in Ypres. Mm -hmm. And there's so many boys like this, and so much, you see so much potential cut short. And, and I think these, these are very special because we can, you know, we, we see these names on, on memorials, and we see them on, on gravestones and things of, of, of the boys who've been killed in the war. But if we look in the dots of the folk, we can actually we can recreate them, we can bring them back to life in a way that, 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 that you simply can't do anywhere else. Um, so, I've kind of talked about this through talking about the, um, you know, the, the, the boys and the girls. Obviously, what was happening, instead of the page being a correspondence page and being a kids page, by 1905 it was nothing like that. It was a Facebook, it was a, it was a social networking site, it was a blog. Um, they would have their nom de plume, which we call usernames now. So the, the, the parallel between these modern online ways that children communicate and, and docile focus is almost identical. It's just the medium's different, that's all. These kids are using the written word and the published paper, whereas the, the kids today use, they use their PCs and their iPads and things. But it's the same thing. And they have, um, they, 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 they also, Established this what they call auto list system. Now, I don't. I'm, I'm not on Facebook. I don't really know about Facebook. But I know that you have to invite people to be your friends, don't you? You have to allow people to be your friends by by, by giving them your password or giving them something like that. 
Um, well, the Gates kids were doing exactly the same thing in 1900. And they were putting in little notices saying, Mayor Cap Eileen would like to correspond privately with Bob. Um, please write here at the post office, Manfredly, or something like that. So, so, so these were the invitations to be friends. And, and the auto, what they called the auto system, coming from the word autograph. And you remember those books we used to have, autograph books, all coloured pages, and you'd write silly poems on them. That's, how they, that, that's where they got the word from. But these autos were little invitations to, to write privately. And to meet as well, because what started to happen is that kids started to meet up. And, the pic and they started to have picnics. They started to, uh, both in Bukago and Dunedin, began a Dotsville Folk Literary and Debating Club, which went for years and years and years. Every week, you get 50 kids turning up every Wednesday night at the, they used the old Settlers Hall at um, Tiger Settlers, and, and, and a debate, you know, all sorts of issues, prohibition, cigarette smoking, um, you know, compulsory training, extraordinary. And, and those dots look like, and they also created, that they, they published their own literary magazine, completely independently of the paper as well, edited it, contributed to it, everything. So, so what you had from this page, from this page which started out as a dear doll, I've got a canary, can you please give it a name? You get a youth culture, and it is a culture because it goes, it, it has every aspect of a true culture um, that is that is nationwide, because there are kids writing the world, and not just the target kids, all, all over, and from the overseas as well, a lot from America, a lot from the UK. Um, so you have this culture social networking culture based on literature and, and based on the written word. So it, it, it was an extraordinary thing. I've talked a little bit about the wartime and, um, and I'll just sort of briefly talk about that. I have a section on the war because the war is incredibly important. Both the South African War and the First World War and to some extent the Second World War. Unfortunately we don't get a lot on the Second World War because the con closed in 1941 because there was a lack of paper. So the ODT, by this time you were title witness closed, witness closed in 1932 and the column had transferred to the ODT. But the, um, in 1941 there wasn't enough paper so the, the, the ODT sliced a lot of its, cut a lot of its features. The Dossal folks stopped in 1941 didn't start until 1955. Uh, so, so we miss out a lot about the First World War, the Second World War, but, but the South African War and especially the First World War, the letters to Dot are the most significant collection of material that we have which tells the story the way this country went through that war. It's absolutely unique and nothing matches it. We have soldier letters, you know, letters coming from the front, but we have nothing going the other way because all those letters have been lost. But in Dot, no, because, because, because what we have now is we have young ones, by this time the teenagers, writing to Dot about what's happening in their families with the war. And as the war, I should say also, at this time, by 1914, when you were a Dotsville folk, you had to, you had to resign when you were 20. You know, that was, that was the age that I put on. But there was a huge fuss made about this because the, no one wanted to say goodbye. <laughs> so every so often, Dot said, okay, every so often I'll have an open week where it was called Old Writers Week, where anyone can write. So, and, and that was established in 1907. So, so by 1914, you could get somebody who's 40 writing to Dots Hill Pace, you know, Dots Hill Pace. So, so when we look at these war letters, we've got to be aware that these aren't letters written by young kids. These are, you know, these are wives, of, even mothers, not perhaps mothers yet, but, but, but wives, older sisters or something like that. So you get, you get a very, and, and, and you, you get from the, from the send-offs, the welcome homes, you get this very personal view of the war and nowhere else, as I said, would you get it. And of course, the, when, the, when, the, when the inevitable happens, when, when the brother or the, or, the, or, the, or the husband or the father is lost, then they write to Dot. And so there's extraordinarily sad, incredibly moving letters. Because these people have grown up with Dot as their confidant. You know, so they're very open with her, and they share a lot of you know, personal feelings with her. Even though, and what's most extraordinary is that it's in the public, you know, everyone can see us in the, in the paper, but, but the relationship between these kids and God was very, was very intimate indeed, and they had no problems about, about 
just, just opening their hearts to her over the war period. And, and the, the section of war is, is phenomenal. And, you know, even we, 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 you read the newspaper's reports, it was the send-offs, for example. And I've done this myself in my first book, Before Anzac. And I write about these send-offs as being, you know, well, they were dancers, as being very celebratory. You know, lots of songs, lots of cheering, and lots of band, you know, band playing. But the kids, when they write about the send-offs and the parades, when they write to Dot, they, they write a very different story indeed. And it makes you wonder what these events were actually like. Because they don't mention anything about them. They don't mention the speeches, they don't mention the singing, they don't mention the, the three cheers. They, they just talk about how sad it is. And one, you know, one example is Otira, her name is, and she's a West Coast girl. And in October 1914, when the first, when the first um, main body of soldiers left, she describes their departure from Greymouth. And she said, oh, by 8.30, everybody was at the station. Everybody couldn't move. And the soldiers, the, 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 but we went out on the platform until the soldiers were seated in the carriages, and then they opened the doors, and everybody rushed. And she said, it was such a fight to get through to the carriages to say goodbye. And then she said, and then the train left. And she said, and that was the saddest, and the, the words were, that was the saddest thing of all, God, because what was left behind were hundreds of mothers and sisters sobbing. That's what she said. So, where's the band playing? You know, where is the flag waving? Even one boy, Dr. Little Folk, um, he left with the 11th, 7th reinforcements, but the boys you know, were writing as soldiers as well. And he describes the departure of the 7th reinforcements from Wellington. Now, if you look at the newspapers, you'll see the photographs of the departure of the 7th. You'll see all the flags and the bands. And Little, he was in that parade as a soldier. And he describes it. And he said, Doc, when you look at the photographs, it makes it look as if it was a happy thing. He said, it was a, he said there was no cheering. He said, we walked past in silence. Now, this doesn't match with what the journalists, what the journalists and the newspapers and the propaganda machine are trying to present as a, as a wonderful event. Well, he was there, and he said it was silent. And it makes you wonder. And, and the, what, we have 21 letters written from the front from, from the boys. The Bears boys, as I said before, you know, the doctors are confident. So we're getting letters from the Western Front describing events in the war. We're getting letters from Gallipoli. We get one extraordinary one from a Scotch lad who's Douglas Leckie. I don't know, Colonel Douglas Leckie, very famous man. Um, was he headmaster of intermediate in Doug, yes. And he became, uh, he, in, the, in the Second World War, he was a, a major commander in um, the Middle East. Well, he wrote a Scotch lad, and he wrote as part of the Canterbury Mounted Rifles in 1918. He returned to Gallipoli. The Canterburys had to reinforce Gallipoli after the war had finished in 1918. And he describes going back. This is the first pilgrimage. And he, he just describes this land of ghosts. And, and he's very moved and affected by the sense of this place. And, and, he, and it's over Christmas time. He said, oh, there was no, there was no celebration. We couldn't celebrate. We couldn't do that in this place. Extraordinary, Douglas Leakey's extraordinary um, letter. So, as well as, I'm going to finish it, as well as, as all of that, I then, because I, as I said before, the, the, there was an honourable writer's week, what we get is, is letters going through whole people's lives. You know, they don't finish in their 20s. We still don't know these people when they're a lot older than that. And, and throughout the book, I showcase this family. Now, the Crawfords came from Mornington. Now, Harry, who's this, the oldest, this one here, is Harry, Bert, Sol, Charlie, Mum, Vincent, and Francis. And Harry started to write in 1889. He was five. And he only wrote to Doc because his little brother had died, and he was very upset. And, mom, and his mama told him to write to Doc because he might feel better. And he did, and this is a very sad little letter at that prison. Now, all of these boys, they called themselves the Sister of Sits because they didn't have any sisters. <laughs> and, and all of those boys, as they came to five and six, started to write. So at one point, they're all six are writing. And they tend to write on the same night. So that you can imagine them, they're all sitting at the dining table in the morning, and scrapping and fighting. So this comes out in the letters because they're, they're, they're funny bunch of boys. And, 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 and so they're always trying to get at each other. And, 
and, and, and their wonderful reactions and their relationships come out in these letters. Now those boys, 1889 it starts, those, the last letters come from the boys in the 1940s. Four of them have gone to the war and they write from the front. They get married, they have their own children, they tell, you know, we know all about that. We just, we just grow up with this family. You know, when, Harry's, when Harry writes, Vincent isn't, starts writing, Vincent isn't even born yet. So it's, it's extraordinary. And, and I was very fortunate to meet the youngest daughter of, of this one's youngest daughter, Jane Vincent. So she lives in Harvard, down in the peninsula. And, and she, she's the one who gave me this wonderful photo of the boys, because they're striking looking kids. And, 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 and you see them as they grow up because they're all different, their personalities are different. You know, they, so, and you can see some of them are going to do very well in life, and others aren't. This one here, Solly, so he calls himself Solomon Slow. And, and he's a very intense boy, and from very early on, there's something wrong with Solomon. Because he's, he's very erratic in his moods, and the boys often say, oh, you know, Sol isn't shining today. And, and, it, 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 and it, he, he suffered, I think, quite early depression. And you just see this in his letters, and he's the, one, the only one who doesn't marry. He doesn't settle down. And he calls himself this rolling stone. And he doesn't like the life, but he says, oh, there's nothing else for me. It's, it, it, they're very disturbing letters in a way. And, and, and his completely different personality. Yet he was as bright and as charming and as witty as, as all of the Warp Six were. But, um, but you could just see that something's not right with Saul's life. And, and, and uh, all of them are extraordinary. Um, but you just see them grow up and, uh, and they take the, the careers they take and the life choices that they make. It was all recorded in the kids' page. And, um, and then the, the last section of the book is to call lifetimes. And, it, and it, wraps, it wraps up with the corporates really. But, but some of them just go on and on and on. And, Dickie Donovan, who I mentioned before, was 18 when he first started to write. His last letter was written when he was 83. And that was to apologise to Dot for not coming down to Dunedin for one of their reunions because he just wasn't well enough to get down. But, um, no, there it is. So, look, I'll just allow for some time for some questions, if anybody's got any questions. So with this photograph, I take it she must have been widowed. So did any of the older lads writing about the bereavement of their father? They, they didn't very much. They were terribly fond of their father. Um, although, it has to be said that the father wasn't this one's father. I don't know father was. Um, but, um, well, he, he died on his chair. The, the, um, the, their father died in 1905. How did you do their father? The father was a shearer, um, and he only came home at Christmas time. And but, but when he did come home, the boys were absolutely beside themselves because they just they absolutely adored their father. And they, they write this wonderful letter about going into George Street on Christmas Eve with their father. And and, and you know the, the, the kids have all got whistles and drums and things. And and Harry describes it as, as, as the father just looked, looking as if he'd just come through the battle zone. <laughs> He said, and all the young kids, you know, all, the, all, all my young brothers were eating buns nearly the size of themselves. And just them. But their father died in 1905, they were very upset about it. They didn't actually mention it very much, they only mentioned it later on. Um, but Vincent, you never knew, but Vincent, one, at one point when the father came home on one day, and, and mother had gone, mother was next door playing bridge, and he went through, and he went, oh, mum, there's, my mum, there's a strange man in the house, you know, don't know who it is. And, you know, and I said, well, who, you know, what does he look like? Oh, so, so. oh that would be your father. <laughs> <laughs> she was an extraordinary woman. She, this woman, she, 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 she convinced, or, or she made these children become very literate. These children were all very well educated, well read. She didn't believe in nursery rhymes, and she didn't believe in children's stories. But when the boys went to bed, she'd read to them, but her favourite book was Dr. Livingstone's Adventures in Africa. Fair enough. Fair and, enough. Um, <laughs> And she wrote, she made, she, she supplemented the family income by writing funeral poetry for the ODT. <laughs> An extraordinary woman. She, she, 
very working class Mornington family, very working class, but, 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 but Sarah, but, but Sarah um, she, she had sort of ideas about her station, she, she was convinced she, she was wanted it best for her children. Yes, yeah. and, 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 and the boys adored their mother, but the mother was hopeless, as, 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 a, as both a mother and a, and a housekeeper. Because the mother never did any housework. And the, and the boys, because she was always too busy playing bridge and trying to be a lady. And, and, and the boys are constantly, from very, very early on, talking about, you know, their household duties and their gardening duties. And I know that from, from you know, personal stories that, 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 um, that Vincent's daughter has told me that, that you know, she was a... They loved her, but she was a bit of a user. <laughs> so, how, so has, did it come out in the letters as well that the... The gentleman on the top left wasn't. No. Oh. No. No. That just came out in the recent. Well, well, it came out through through the family, through the oh, history given yeah. by by the daughter. No. Oh, yeah. He um, no, he wasn't. But um. Can I ask? And I think he 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 knew that he wasn't. Yeah. Well, the mother had actually. Well, we're getting away from the book now, but but the mother had on um, the both the birth certificate and the marriage certificate. When, when Joan, the, you know, the one that I met, did the family research and she got the original copies, I said, well, oh, has this been near the fire or something like that? Because it had all, almost like, you know, fire spark burns. And then she wrote, oh no, that all of the dates have been burnt out by the mother. So, um, wow. yeah, so yeah, that's that story. <laughs> wow. yes. So, how did you begin researching this book? Is there a, like an archive down at the ODT? Well, it's, it's all in, everything comes out of the printed paper. It's, mm -hmm. So the Otago Witness is published every week, mm -hmm. and, and, and this, the, the column from 1986. Now that's all on microfilm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, um, so, so it's just really a question of just reading every single um, edition of Dots to Folk from 1886 to, I mean through to 1941. So when does the book actually finish on like the last? I, I kind of finish it. I finish it. I finish it in the 1940s, really, mm -hmm. and and I, I I don't carry on for several reasons. One, even after the First World War, the column was a changed thing. The culture that I talked about, you know, the, the, the debating clubs and the mm -hmm. and the picnics and the photographs and and the, all the blogging thing, that didn't survive the First World. Um, when they, even even though you know when, when, the, when the boys came back, the, the clubs didn't reopen for some reason. I thought, I I, I think you see here that they saw that world as now gone. Mm -hmm. um, you know that, that it could not be reclaimed. That 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 grown up and moved oh, away. So to a large extent, they probably traumatised by yes. the war. Um, so, the women so, as well as yes. the men. So you didn't, you, the letters continued, the column continued mm -hmm. very strongly, mm -hmm. but it didn't have that culture that mm -hmm. it had before. Mm -hmm. Only in old writers' weeks, when the old ones came back again, mm -hmm. did you get that spark again. And also, it was partly to do with Dot, because by, well, in the 1930s, Dot was Elaine Soper, um, Elaine Service. I think you may know, some of you may know that name. Now, whereas the early Dots have been quite liberal and, and let the kids have quite a free hand, Eileen Soper saw this page as an extension of a school curriculum. So she didn't like she didn't like the kids using slang. She didn't like them being cheeky. Right? So she she shuttled she, she shuttled that down. And so the letters start to get slightly uninteresting. Mm -hmm. In a way that they've been uninteresting at the very beginning. Yeah. Um, so it went full circle a bit, but it, it still continued. But, but, but it's, as I said, it's only when the old writers' weeks come that you get the kids writing and that all sparks up and again. But, but it's, it's interesting that the clubs, the clubs closed down in 1915 and they didn't reopen at all. They just... And, and one, one... And there's all, all sorts of reasons for that too. And one writes, an ex-president, Shasta. The girls, by the, these clubs are interesting too because talking about the teenage girls, these girls were very empowered in these clubs. They were office holders, they were presidents, extremely. So, that they, they loved this environment because that was one area that they could be true equals in, and even more than equals. And Shash just talks about why the clubs didn't open and, she's, and she, she, she says, well, we've got the picture houses now. 
we've got cars, you know, we've got other diversions. And she sees meeting every Wednesday night to talk about compulsory training or some sort of social issue just didn't seem to fit the 1920s. You know? mm -hmm. So you can see certain sea changes. Mm -hmm. But you know, as I say, I, I, I do go a little bit, I talk about the first the second world war a bit and, and pretty much even though, as I said, the column continued right through to the 1980s. But, but by then it was called For the Younger Reader, and Dot, Dot was uh, hardly even it. it was all full of cartoons and puzzles, and mm -hmm. no, it wasn't really very much. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. right. um, Meeting with someone does do research on the Facebook of the modern generation. Mm -hmm. God, oh, God. God. Don't do this. Don't do this. Don't do this. I think this would have taken my particular early ones. You know, I think there's a lot more courage in putting, yeah. you know, putting it out there yeah. Yeah. Well, than by Facebook. Facebook because it's there. Yeah. Well, I mean, they did hide to some extent. They hid behind the non yeah. um, Well, they learned they, to hide behind the non They were very mm -hmm. candid. Um, and, 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 it was one of the reviews, I can't remember which one, you know, I talked, it was, was, was said, you know, just, it's so interesting to see how brutally honest these young people are, you know, they, they, they don't have any problems about speaking their mind, you know, and, and it's, a, it's, it's a big book, but it's not one that you have to read from beginning to end, you don't have to, you don't have to be reading a later chapter, or you don't have to read the beginning to, to enjoy the halfway through because it's all quite sectionalised yeah. and, and the only thing you can do with the Crawfords you do because you, you need to follow their story but, um, but it's, it, it's very thematic and I, I, I try to do a thematic approach so that people think okay, if I want to read about the Gordian adolescence I want to just put a more so even though it's Paul Little and North South magazine called it gargantuan no. and he, he, said, he said Keith Scott's book must wait he stopped walk away as much as the little folk did in 1986. <laughs> 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 that was a bit brutal. And they took him a baby or an infant. Or a toddler. <laughs> and in terms of the book, um, I mean, we do have copies at the library, but if people wanted to buy one, yeah, it's all in the shops. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, UBS, Paper Plus, Wickles. Or at the board of shops. I know, I know Paper Plus have been very supportive of the book, they, 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 so they've they showcased it a lot. So go to Paper Plus one of the work calls because they've only got two copies. Yeah, the SP for example. Yes, yeah, yeah. 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 Do you have an index of names? On yes. Yes, um, there's a big index. There's an index of, of names as far as I can establish them. There's an index of non oh, okay. Um and, and I also give I, you, you do, by sort of all sorts of ways, discover who these people are. Um, particularly in when they were, when they resigned, you were supposed to send in your farewell letter. And when you did your farewell letter, you were supposed to actually say who you were. And so quite a lot of them did at that point. So you think, oh, Dickie Donald, oh, that's been nice and now. And um, these boys were hard to trace. It doesn't look it, it, when you read the book, it does not look. It took months to work out the relationship that these six boys were related. It's just <laughs> extraordinary. Because they were all using non diploma and I said, oh gosh, about they? And eventually I sorted it all out. Um, and yeah, you, you, there, there were ways. And, 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 and you'll find you, if you're a Togo people, and they were largely a Togo, or Southland particularly, particularly Southland. Yeah, and you'll, you'll find your family in there. I found, I found, one grandmother, lots and lots of great uncles, lots, lots of great uncles and great great uncles in there, and um, it's, you know, just like the shiny bulb that I was talking about before, the one that's killed in the war. Um, grand, grandma, grandma, where she was, she wrote for years and years and years, many a total maiden, she called this. <laughs> and in fact, there were nine children in that family, and at one point, all nine right, one letter after the other. And, I, and, and they talk about being a Uber and their dad being a butcher. I thought, oh, yes, of course, this is, this is, this is my family. So it's interesting, you'll find some things that you, you know, the, this column at its height in the early 1900s was full.
four pages long in the house. Four pages. pages. Four big spreads. And the average letter count <coughs> at that time would be around 4,000 letters a year. Extraordinary. Dot gave up trying to keep a register <laughs> of, because she said it's just too many. Because they kept asking her, you know, how, how many how many of us are there? Because they called themselves DLF, Dot Sittle Folk. They had a badge. They, they had a little badge that, they, that, that, that the ADT sold. And, and, and the badge was very important because that was part of the, this culture. Mm. And, it, and it had an etiquette with it. If you wore your badge, you were supposed to what they called, did, do what they called the witness smile. <laughs> and, and, and say, oh, hello, Dot Sittle Folk. And then the other would hello. What's your nom de plume? And, and so there was this whole ritual developing. Mm. And of course, if it didn't happen, the kids got really upset about this, and they often write in. So I, thought, I saw that. I saw a girl in, in George Street the other day. She had a badge on. Dot, and, and, and I went up to her and and I said, "Hello, DLF." And she said, "The look I got that would make your bone marrow freeze." <laughs> <laughs> she said, "That should." She said, okay, anyway, "No one. If, if you're going to wear a badge, that's not the way you behave." And, and so they're, they're very upset about this. So this is the way that, you know, the county shows on the train, in the bus, or something like that, you know, you'd see this little badge, and, you know, you felt as if you were part of a, a, a group, of a culture. Like, like the Scouts and Guides, in your ways. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.